113 Questions About Evolution with John Perry. Evolutionary question number 26. What are essential genes and how did they evolve? Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of Evolutionary Questions. Today's question comes from Aki. He asks, Hey, John, are you aware of the latest research suggesting that mutations are not as random as we thought? Certain genes are less protected by DNA repair mechanisms. It goes on a little bit there. But yes, Aki, I am aware of that research. Well, I'm pretty sure I'm aware of the same thing that you're talking about. This paper published January of 2022, Mutation Bias Reflects Natural Selection in Arabidopsis thaliana. Arabidopsis thaliana is this plant right here. Geneticists have been studying it for a long time. It's a really easy plant to grow in the laboratory. What they found here is that mutation rates are extremely slow in essential genes. And something that I want to point out here is that they're not saying that natural selection is doing this actively. They're saying that mutation rates themselves are actually slower in essential genes. I've been seeing a lot of interesting interpretations of this on the internet. A lot of people freaking out saying that everything we thought we knew about evolution is now wrong and so on. That is not the case. In next week's video, I will explain why that's not the case, but that's for next week's video. Today, I want to talk about essential genes. What are these essential genes? And again, this paper says that mutation frequency is reduced by half inside of gene bodies. So these are protein coding genes and by two thirds in essential genes. So today we're going to go over what are essential genes and how do they evolve? An essential gene is kind of what you would expect it to be. It's kind of what it sounds like. It is a gene that is so important to an organism that disrupting its function results in cell death. If you're a single celled organism, that's just your death in general. Or if you're a developing fetus, developmental failure. And what do I mean there by disrupting a gene's function? What, what does it take to disrupt a gene's function? Some of these genes, in order to disrupt their function, you have to mutate the heck out of them. Lots of mutations or maybe even a, a full scale deletion. I mean, that'll definitely do it, right? That'll definitely disrupt that gene's function. But some genes are so entrenched, such an essential part of a cell's function and so important to be exactly the way that they are, that even point mutations, single point mutations can cause a disruption in these genes. These are essential genes. Let me give you an example of an essential gene. One of the most essential genes known in the human genome, the H4 histone gene. This is a protein that it codes for. This is the H4 histone protein, this little green thing here. This is sort of a rough approximation of what that protein looks like in ribbon form. And what this protein does is it combines with other proteins. Those proteins bind to DNA and are very important for how DNA is packaged inside of cells, inside of plant cells and inside of animal cells. And so if you mutate this gene, the gene that codes for this protein, well, that will change the protein's shape. And if you change that protein shape even a little bit, this whole structure fails. DNA could not be properly packaged inside of cells, and so the cell dies. This is an extremely, extremely essential gene. How essential? How sensitive is it to mutation? The histone H4 gene, it codes for a protein that is 102 amino acids long, that, that green protein we just saw. 100 of those amino acids are identical in both plant and animal cells. This suggests that only two non-synonymous mutations have survived in over 1.5 billion years of evolution because 1.5 billion years ago is when plants and animals split from each other. That's when they shared their common ancestor. This is an extremely essential gene. Other essential genes can actually withstand a lot more mutation than that, but this is an extremely essential gene. And when we find genes like this, it forces us to ask the question, how did that gene evolve? How did organisms evolve with only part of that gene? Or maybe not that gene at all, right? I mean, of course, there was a point in history where that gene did not exist. How on earth were organisms surviving back then if this is an essential gene? It turns out that humans have over 2,472 essential genes, probably more than that, actually. The way that we come to this number is we do experiments on mice, <laughs> mice that have a lot of the same genes that humans have. And we've figured out that 2,472 of our shared genes with mice are essential 
for the mouse's survival. One of the main ways that you figure out if a gene is essential or not is you mutate it and then you see if the fetus will still develop. And of course, that's not really ethical to do with humans, so we do that on mice. That means you got to take that number with a grain of salt. But still, how did our ancestors survive before all 2,472 essential genes evolved? It might be worth putting that number in perspective. Humans have uh, roughly between 20 and 30,000 protein coding genes, 2,472 that are essential. That represents about 10% of our protein coding genes. So how did our ancestors survive before all 2,472 essential genes evolved? Well, essential genes start out as merely profitable genes. There are many ways that that can happen, but there's three that I want to bring up here because they're so important and they're really cool concepts to think about in evolution. So traits that start out profitable can become essential through what's called scaffold removing. So other genes will atrophy after the new gene evolved because they're no longer needed. That new gene does something that they used to be doing. And so they can then atrophy. And once they atrophy, that new gene is essential. Entrenchment is another way. So mutations or other adaptations throughout the genome can build upon the new gene, forming dependencies. An example of this, like let's say you have a gene that causes better blood circulation. Well, that allows for future mutations elsewhere in the genome that will cause denser body tissues to form in the organism. Those denser body tissues were not possible until we had good blood circulation. Now that they are possible, and now that they exist, now that they have evolved into existence, well, <laughs> you definitely can't get rid of that gene that causes really good blood circulation because now the rest of the organism depends on that. That's called entrenchment. And then finally, there's niche expansion. The British folks like to call that niche expansion. A profitable gene can allow organisms to survive in environments that used to be deadly. Once established in a previously deadly environment, a harsh environment, that profitable gene is now essential. And of course, ecological scaffold removal. And that's where a niche where it used to be really easy to survive in, where, it, where the organism first evolved in, that niche can disappear. The population has evolved a new gene that allowed them to expand their niche. And then the original niche where they came from, that ends up getting destroyed through some sort of ecological, you know, whatever, climate change or something like that. And so now that, that ecological scaffolding, so the that was there for them to evolve this new gene in the first place, that's now removed and they're completely dependent on the new gene and is absolutely essential for the entire species now, not just that one population that lives in the harsh environment. It's now essential for everybody. All right, so I've given you a bunch of concepts here and bullet point lists of stuff. And I showed you this histone coding gene that's essential for humans. But talking about genes, which are these molecules that interact with their environments in, in ways that are really foreign to us, it can be kind of hard to follow these arguments. And so I want to bring this home somehow. First, I want to talk about human civilizations. And then I want to talk about organs, how organs actually evolve. And the reason I want to talk about human civilizations is that cities, civilizations, they actually develop. They evolve in a way that's very, very similar to the way that biological systems evolve. Human civilizations are not very top-down directed. I mean, we, we all vote for presidents and we have kings and rulers and all that, but civilization is actually mainly governed by local interactions. Things expand and contract. All sorts of unpredictable, unguided things happen. So there's a bunch of processes that we can see in the development of a civilization that are absolutely mirrored in biological evolution, or I guess you could say it's the other way around. Civilization development mirrors biological evolution. This is the city of Montreal. There are a lot of essential structures in this city. Back in 1998, one of the essential genes, you could say, of the city, the essential traits of the city, electricity, was destroyed. We had a huge, huge ice storm. Several inches of ice were covering everything in the city, and that absolutely destroyed power lines. 
There were seven days of ice that left people without electricity for 30 days, and it caused total chaos. There were accidental fires as people were trying to heat their houses with fires, and a lot of people didn't really remember how to use a fireplace because they hadn't used it for so long. There were suffocations, people getting too much smoke in their house. There was death by freezing, people who just couldn't get their houses warm enough, and the military had to come in and rescue people. It was insane. They would set up generators at schools, and people would just go live in there and, and camp inside the gym. It was nuts. Absolute chaos. And this is really interesting to think about because, of course, when the territory now known as Montreal was first colonized by humans, they didn't have electricity. When electricity was made available, it was profitable. It was not essential. It was not essential to anything. Eventually, though, electricity became essential. And how did it become essential? Well, first off, you have scaffold removal. People who used to know how to light fires in their fireplaces, and they had wood stored to keep those fires burning. Well, they stopped storing wood, and they stopped cleaning their chimneys, and they stopped practicing fire building. And so you had all these fires, and you had people suffocating of smoke and so on. That was atrophy, scaffold removal. You have entrenchment. Electricity in Montreal has become absolutely essential because our heating systems, they depend on electricity. Most of them, not all of them. A lot of transportation depends on electricity. In order to distribute food to the people, you need to run stores, and those stores use electricity to operate. They use electricity to power the lights and the heaters of those stores, and they use electricity to process transactions. So people weren't able to buy food. Even if you wanted to just buy your food in cash, don't use your credit card and stuff like that. Well, you can't because you can't get cash because the bank's not working. So everything failed because of the entrenchment of electricity in Montreal. And then last but not least here, you've got niche expansion. A lot of people who couldn't handle fluctuations in temperature lived in Montreal. People who are really old were really sick. They were able to establish themselves in Montreal just fine, even though they were old, even though they were sick, because they had electricity there. Well, once that electricity was removed, Montreal became deadly. So again, traits that start out as being profitable can become essential through scaffold removal, entrenchment, and niche expansion. Now, every time I do a lesson about evolution and I, I mention cities and I use examples of cities, I always get creationists who say, well, Cities were intelligently designed by humans. And of course, that is partly true. I mean, the city itself isn't really designed, but there is some city planning, which is done intelligently. And of course, all of the little inventions and stuff that we talked about were designed through intelligence. So yeah, let's just go ahead and accept that criticism and let's look at biology. A couple of years ago, I did a talk, which I've got a link to it in the video description over an hour long. What evolved first, the brain, the heart, or the stomach? And I'm going to take some slides from that, and I'm going to talk about the evolution of the heart. Which evolved first, blood, blood vessels, or heart? And I'm going to talk about blood, blood vessels, and the heart instead of talking about genes specifically because these structures are more relatable to people than genes. Tetrapods, which includes reptiles and mammals and amphibians, all the backbone things that live at least partially on land. We all have very complicated hearts, multiple chambers. There's a really strong muscle in there that's constantly pulsating. It is a very complex structure and it is essential for our survival. And so the question you can ask is how on earth did our ancestors survive without a heart if the heart is essential? The same goes for blood vessels and blood. Well, if we look at the tree of life, if we do a little bit of comparative anatomy to different organisms in different parts of the tree of life today, we can put together a rough sketch of what happened, how it is that the heart evolved. It's not going to be a perfect picture, of course, because the organisms that are alive today, they've been evolving forever, just like we have. And so when we do comparative anatomy, even if we're looking at organisms that are really distantly related from us on the evolutionary tree, they're not really perfect representatives of our ancestors. When I look at the flatworm here, for example, we did not evolve from flatworms. Humans and flatworms evolved from a common ancestor, which would have had common traits. But we can put together a rough sketch of what happened, how it is that the heart evolved. The simplest animals on our planet are sponges, and sponges live just fine without a heart. The pros of being a sponge is that the ocean is their blood, their cells are loosely packed, and they don't do much work. 
The cons is that they, they can't live outside of nutrient-rich areas of the sea. The ocean is their blood, and it has to be really nutrient-rich in order for them to survive. And then, of course, the con is that they can't play video games. <laughs> they don't have much energy compared to other animals, and they can't move around freely like other animals. Here I've got cnidarians. I don't really want to talk about them. Let's look at the flatworm. The flatworm also doesn't have a heart. It doesn't have blood vessels. It doesn't even have blood. It also uses the ocean as its blood. But on top of that, it roams around searching for food. Because it can roam around and search for food, it doesn't need the ocean to be as nutrient rich as the sponge does. Like this thing can actively search out food. That said, it does have problems processing oxygen. In order to make sure that oxygen gets to every one of its cells, this organism is highly limited in size. They cannot get very big. If they get too big, their tissues just start dying because they can't get enough oxygen. And flatworms are <laughs> stuck being flat. Being flat gives you a large surface area for oxygen to be passed from the water to your cells directly. That's how they survive without having blood vessels and a heart. If we move further still, closer to tetrapods in the evolutionary tree, we find things like acorn worms, hemichordates. They're actually hollow on the inside, and that allows their gut, so the, the green thing here is the gut of this organism. They, they eat food, the food goes into their, their little mouth part here. That food is processed by the gut, and then particles are transmitted through this liquid in the body cavity here, the coelom. It's distributed to the cells of the body. So being hollow is another way to increase your surface area, just like being flat is a way to, to increase your surface area. But being hollow like this allows for a lot more structural exploration. Hemichordates are a lot more diverse in form than flatworms are. And if we zoom in at the top here, we see that they actually have the beginnings of a circulatory system. There is a muscle that can pulsate in the head of an acorn worm, and that squishes this little bulb here, and that bulb I've drawn it a little bit more simple than it is in real life. It's actually kind of a mess of a structure. I'm drawing it here as a tube that just has a hole at the end. It's actually just the tube itself just kind of opens up into the coelom, the general body cavity. And there's all kinds of folds in it and weird little structures. But as the head moves around and as this little muscle flexes, liquid gets sucked in and squirted out of this tube. And that causes circulation. That speeds up oxygen flow inside this organism's body, and it speeds up the flow of nutrients inside this organism's body. It's called an open circulatory system. Very, very primitive. If we move up, again, getting closer to us organisms with complex hearts, we find lancelets. So these are simple chordates. And if you look at them, they have a closed circulatory system. They don't have true blood yet, so I've got blood vessels. Blood is in quotes here because their blood isn't really true blood. There's no blood cells. But they do have vessels and they have a closed circulatory system forming a big network of vessels. And these vessels themselves can pulsate. The vessel walls are lined with muscle and they can pulsate, allowing the transfer of nutrients and oxygen throughout the body. They don't have a heart, but they have pulsating blood vessels. This circulatory system isn't super efficient compared to the circulatory systems of organisms that have hearts, a heart is way more efficient than this. And because of that, these animals also can't get very big. They're very restricted. This restriction is due to their poor circulation, which makes it so that cells can't get enough oxygen or enough nutrients if the animal gets too big. The heart evolved from arteries in really small organisms. Next up, we're going to look at a hagfish. In hagfish, we start to see a very strong division of labor in the circulatory system. Instead of having muscles all throughout the whole thing that pulsate, those muscles have moved pretty much entirely into a single bulb in the chest. In bony fish, we have what sort of looks like a four-chambered heart in tube form. Everything's all spread out. And then in amphibians and other tetrapods, we see that all of those sacs condense into the single multi-chambered heart that you and I are all familiar with. Essential organs evolve in the same way that essential genes evolve. Again, an essential gene is a gene so important to an organism that disrupting its function results in cell death or developmental failure. And how is it that essential genes evolve? Traits that start out as profitable, genes that start out as profitable, can become essential through scaffold removal, through entrenchment, and through niche expansion. 
just like we can trace the evolution of the heart and the circulatory system, and we can find that there are ways where the evolution of this system would have been profitable but not essential in its early starting, genes start out being profitable and then become essential through the process of evolution. And these here are some of the evolutionary dynamics that cause that to happen. Next week, I will finish answering Aki's question. If you want to hear that, make sure that you are subscribed and that you hit the little bell icon. So long for now.